control mechanism for metabolic pathways. Okay. Look at this curve. What did, we, what did I say happens when we see a sigmoidal curve on a V versus S plot? What does that mean? Anybody remember? What's that? It has quaternary structure, but there's a term I use to describe this enzyme. Allosteric, right? So when we see a sigmoidal plot on a V versus S, it tells us we've got an allosteric enzyme. And all that this is showing us is that depending upon what we mix with that enzyme, the properties of the enzyme change. The properties of the enzyme change depending upon what we mix with it. Look what happens. Here's the enzyme all by itself. It doesn't have any thing else except for substrate. We see a nice little sigmoidal plot. If we take and we do the same reaction and we add CTP to it, look at how much slower that pathway is working, or that, that, that reaction is working. The enzyme is being inhibited. It doesn't turn it completely off. I should emphasize this. You'll see that there's still a little bit of activity there. Cellular controls are generally not on-off. They're much more like what I call a volume knob. You can turn them up, you turn them down, but you don't usually turn them on or turn them off. It's louder or it's quieter. In this case, it's quieter because there's less reaction going on. On the other hand, look what happens if we add ATP to it. We see an increase in velocity. We see the enzyme has the volume knob turned up. It's much more active when that's present. And if you remember yesterday, I said ATP was an indication that cell had a lot of energy. And when it has a lot of energy, it's ready to divide. It wants to make nucleotides so it can divide. And it makes sense to turn this enzyme on to make nucleotides. OK. Let's see. ATCase turns out to be a very interesting enzyme. And maybe you should have to draw that on an exam. What do you think? Extra credit for artistic effort, right? So you get you draw really good when you get extra credit. Okay. It turns out that ATCase um, is a rather complicated enzyme. Instead of having four subunits, it has um, a total of twelve. Okay. It has two sets of three subunits called catalytic subunits, and two sets of three what are called regulatory subunits. Now. That means that the different subunits have different functions. So first of all, this is a multi-subunit enzyme. It has quaternary structure, meaning it has multiple subunits. No surprise, because it is allosteric. Okay. The regulatory subunits are the subunits that bind to either ATP or CTP. And what they do is they convert the enzyme into either the T state, what did T state correspond to in hemoglobin? It was tight and it didn't bind oxygen so much. So T state in an enzyme corresponds to the volume turned down. Much less active. So when the regulatory subunit binds to CTP, we see the volume on this enzyme turned down. It doesn't catalyze a reaction. When the regulatory subunit binds to ATP, the enzyme flips into the R state, and now the volume is turned up, and it's very active. Okay, So the regulatory subunits bind to either CTP or to ATP. Now, that leaves the catalytic subunits, and not surprisingly by their name, the catalytic subunits are the places where, or is the place where the reaction is being catalyzed. Okay. It's the place where the reaction is being catalyzed. Okay. Now, mechanisms of catalysis. You know, I think I'm going to make the executive decision here. I'm not going to talk about that. You guys want to do it on your own and pick it up for the exam? Okay, let's not talk about it at all. We'll, we'll not we'll not have it on the exam. Okay.
I think it, it, it actually muddies the water. It makes a much more confusing picture than we need to have about enzymes. I want you to have the big picture, and this is kind of getting into details that don't matter an awful lot for what we're going to do. Okay. Um, how about a joke? Just want to get up and stretch. Just get up and stretch, then I'll tell you a joke. Get up. Come on. Ah, does that feel good? The mid lecture break. It's funny, I see people smiling after they do this. They've been sitting there uncomfortably going, when is he going to shut up? Okay. All right. So, quick joke. All right. So, there's, um, there's this. Um, There's this guy, he's walking down the street. And he looks down and he finds this magic bottle in front of him. Okay? And so he picks it up, and as soon as he picks it up, this genie pops out, of course, and says, Three wishes. All right? Three wishes. And he says, Okay. He says, Huh. Well, he says, I want to be rich beyond my wildest dreams. Poof! Okay. The certificate appears in his hands, and it says that he's got a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. All right. Money? I want to be as powerful as I can be. Poof. Certificate appears in his hands, and he's the president of Microsoft or Apple. It doesn't really matter. Okay? This is really awesome. He's, he's really powerful. Okay, so money, power. Okay, I want every woman to love me. Poof! He turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> you thought it was going to be dirty, didn't you? <laughs> okay, it's not a dirty joke. It's kind of a sexist joke, though. Maybe that's not a better one. I like chocolate, too, so. Okay. What I want to do now, we talked about one way of controlling enzymes. And what we're going to do is talk about two primary ways in this class of controlling enzymes. One way of controlling enzymes is allosteric. And the definition of allosteric, you remember, was a small molecule binding to a protein and affecting its activity. That effect can be positive to make it more active. It can be negative to make it less active. And it's going to depend upon the protein and the molecule involved. So allosteric control is one way of controlling an enzyme. And enzymes have to be controlled. Just like I said, you've got speed limits in going to Fred Meyer so that you don't kill everybody on the way, so too does the cell want to have some control over pathways because, for example, it doesn't want to be burning all of its glucose up if it's got plenty of energy. Just like you're not going to light a fire in your fireplace in the summer on a 90 degree day. Not a good idea. So too does your cell not want to have some reactions going at certain times. It wants to be able to control those. It needs to be able to control those. So allosteric control is one way in which the cell can actually accomplish what it needs. It's not the only way that cells use. The other mechanism that cells use to control things is what's called covalent modification. So covalent modification involves a chemical change to the enzyme. The enzyme is chemically modified. This is covalent, meaning that it's stuck on the enzyme or taken off of the enzyme. Okay, very important consideration. Now, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of different types of covalent modification. The first of these we'll talk about several times during the term. It's called phosphorylation. And phosphorylation, as its name implies, involves putting on a phosphate onto a protein. Well, phosphate's negatively charged. What, do you, what effect do you suppose that putting a, a, a negative charge onto a protein might have? It's charged, so it may change the sort of shape of the protein a little bit, because now it's maybe re repelling some other negative charge or attracted to some positive charge or something like that. It could change the shape of the protein, and in changing the shape of a protein, that may be the way it's changing the function of the protein. And that's exactly what happens. Some proteins get activated by phosphorylation, 
some proteins get inactivated by phosphorylation. And again, volume up, volume down. So it depends on the protein. If we look at the proteins, and you don't need to know this at the moment, but if we look at the proteins in, for example, glycogen metabolism, glycogen is a polymer of glucose, putting phosphates onto proteins in glycogen metabolism causes the ones that break down glucose to become active, or breaks down glycogen to become active, okay? Taking a phosphate off of proteins causes those proteins to become inactive. Whereas putting a phosphate onto proteins that make glycogen is the opposite. They become inactive, we take it off, it becomes active. So it depends on the protein is the bottom line. It depends on, wh uh, on what the function of that protein is and how it's set up with phosphorylation. Well, where do we put phosphates onto proteins? There are three places. Okay. One is the amino acid serine, because serine has a side chain of a hydroxyl group. <coughs> All of the amino acids that get phosphates put onto them have hydroxyls in their side chain. And there are only three of them. Serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So this is what it looks like. We put a, we, and, and generally, we put the phosphate on. It comes from ATP. That phosphate goes on there. We're left behind with ADP. And now we've got a protein that has a serine with a phosphate on it. We've changed the charge in a region of the protein. And therefore, we probably have changed the shape of that protein, as well as the function. OK, here's what threonine looks like. OK, blah, blah, very similar. And here's what tyrosine looks like. It looks quite a bit different. Tyrosine has a benzene ring. And putting phosphates onto tyrosine is, is actually the most interesting of the three. We'll talk later in the class about signaling. Signaling, OK? In a, in a multicellular organism, the cells have to talk to each other. They have to talk to each other. Your liver cell has to receive signals from your muscle cells. I'll give you an example. If I go out on my morning jog, OK? My muscle cells start using ATP because that's what muscles do when they contract. And how do, how, do, how do muscles make ATP? By burning glucose. My muscles have some glucose stored in them, but not a lot. So I can go a little ways before all of a sudden my muscle cells start going, I need glucose. They send a little hormone signal out to my liver, which has a lot of glycogen stored in it. Glycogen is a polymer of glucose. And it tells the liver, break down that glycogen and dump it in the bloodstream because we're out here running stupid. We need to have glucose. That's signaling. Okay? That signaling happens through a process. We'll talk about this process later. But it happens through a phosphorylation process, just as you see right here. Okay? So signaling is a very important way for cells to talk to each other. And they're doing it by controlling enzymes. Okay. Here's another very important uh, covalent modification that happens to a protein. This covalent modification happens to a protein that's in, your, in the membrane of every cell in your body. Every cell in your body. It's, in, in fact, in the membrane of almost every cell in the face of the Earth. This protein is called the sodium potassium ATPase. So, or you can call it NAK ATPase. This protein is surprisingly important. I'll tell you why in a second. This protein, what it does is you can see that this protein, it's, it's labeled here as E, okay? It gets a phosphate put onto it. And when it gets a phosphate put onto it, it grabs sodium from the, outside of, from the, from the inside of your cell and kicks it outside the cell. Before, as it's, as it's getting rid of this phosphate here, it grabs sodium from the outside and brings it inside. So this protein is doing two things. 